When I was a graduate student, I wanted to be Thelma from the Flintstones for Halloween. I went to a grocery store and I bought a dog bone for my hair. And on my way out, I saw a man looking straight into my eyes. Almost immediately, I knew I was in trouble. The next thing I knew, I was on the pavement with a gun to my head. I got hit on the head with the gun, and my head was bleeding, and I was rushed to the emergency room, where I spent the night filled with fear and anger. I wanted my attacker dead then, but I feel compassionate with him now. So I'm a developmental psychologist and um, uh, the director of the Kids Interaction and Neurodevelopment Lab. Much of my research program was shaped by the events of that night. And my research looks at the neurobiology of empathy and how it can go awry in children with aggression. Today I want to share with you some insights from neuroscience and also from working with aggressive kids in how those insights helped me consider my aggressor as somebody worthy of compassion and remediation. And with that in mind, I want to share with you three things today. The first, we can identify neurobiological factors associated with aggression as early as childhood. Second, these factors are not immutable. They can be amplified or attenuated with experience. And third, Perhaps most important of all, if we understand how neurobiology and experience shape aggressive behavior, this can help us change how we, can, how we treat aggressive people. So advances in brain imaging technology, such as magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, have allowed neuroscientists to look under the hood of aggressive people and look into the inside of their brain and ask questions such as, are our brains different between violent and nonviolent people? So we use structural MRI to look in the inside of a living human brain and take a high quality photograph. We can ask questions such as, how much gray matter does the brain contain? And is that different between aggressive and non-aggressive people? So we also use functional MRI or fMRI to take a kind of movie of people as they participate in tasks such as um, witnessing fear or distress or pain in others. So here's a picture of um, our new MRI scanner at UCR, which is actually right around the corner from our, from our building. Um, and I use both of these techniques to look at why and how children become aggressive. Because even though the media focuses on these extreme incidents, uh, these extreme instances of violence among adult males, the truth is that violence later in life is actually quite rare in a perpetrator's life. And we can observe aggressive behavior much earlier, as young as two or three years of age, and sometimes even in the first year of life. Um, so in my work, I focus on children with conduct disorder. And these are um, problems such as aggression and bullying and hurting animals. So I look at these children, and um, I show them movies of um, people in pain or in distress. I want to I want to understand how they respond to these movies. So I'm going to show you an, an example of one of um, the images that I showed, and this I did in collaboration with uh, my colleagues at the University of Chicago. Um, just to warn you, these clips were designed um, to, to, to demonstrate pain and to elicit empathic responses. What we see is we see the engagement of a network of regions that are engaged in processing pain and distress in others. And that network overlaps with a network that we have um, in processing pain and distress in ourselves. And this has now been replicated in a number of labs, both in adults and in children. So when we show these kinds of movies to, to kids with conduct disorder, what we see is we see two different patterns of behavior. Both of these patterns are very different from what we see in typically developing kids. So in one group of kids, these are kids with conduct disorder who are high on traits known as callous unemotional traits. 
And these kids, with this kind of profile, they don't really care about the emotions of other people. So they might, a child with callous and emotional traits might, for example, um, steal another child's lunch money in school or trip a classmate in the hallway and not really care about the feelings of that child. And these kids are particularly problematic. Um, they are at a really increased incidence for aggressive behavior in adulthood. And these are the kids that we, really, um, that, that, we, that we look out for. So what we see when these kinds of kids look at images like that in the scanner is that they show an attenuated response in this pain processing distress network. So that's one group of kids. The other group of kids are also diagnosed with conduct disorder, so they have the same disorder, but they're low on these callous and emotional traits. What we see here is that they're high on what are known as reactive, aggressive kids. And these kids are um, they're very emotional, they're very emotionally reactive and volatile, and um, they often misunderstand and misrepresent emotions. So these kids might punch or kick or um, shove another kid because they feel that they've been provoked or threatened when in fact they haven't. So mis they misread emotional information, they misread intentions as hostile or threatening, when in fact they're not. So when these kinds of kids um, look at images of pain and distress in the scanner, what we see is that they show an amplified response, right? So the second um, set of studies, we still need to replicate that, but these findings tell us that the responses here are very different between the two kinds of children. So the second kind of kid, what might be happening is they might feel threatened or defensive themselves. So what I find remarkable here, we see all of these kids with aggressive behavior, but when we look closely at their neural patterns, we see that they get to these behaviors in such different ways. Another way of saying that is to say that even though all three groups of children they're seeing the same thing, right? They're seeing somebody being hurt, a person being hurt, but they're not experiencing it the same way. And I think that that's where the challenge to compassion lies. The most difficult thing about being compassionate towards another person, in particular when they're antisocial and violent, is to try to understand their experience in the way that they're experiencing it. Not in the way that we experience it, but the way that they experience it. Um, and compassion is really stepping outside of ourselves and into the experience of another person. And I think only when we do that can we confront the problem of violence and the prevention of violence. So I admit um, that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, in my work, also outside of work, it's difficult to, to feel compassion for kids who are hurting animals or who are aggressive, it's much easier to be compassionate with, a, with an anxious child or with a worried child. And I'm, I'm actually I'm not always really good at it. I'm not always able to do it. But at times I can. And it's those times that are most rewarding for me and where I feel like I'm most able to grow, both as a scientist and as a human being. So one, I think one particular instance comes to mind um, when I was able to do that. And here, I was about to scan a nine-year-old boy with conduct disorder. And this boy was aggressive. He had a diagnosis, but he was also quite afraid of going into the scanner. He was visibly afraid, and he was getting upset, but he insisted on trying. So he went in, um, and we scanned him. Um, but then he became afraid again, and he started crying. And in that moment, his mother was standing right next to him. And she went in and started hitting him and yelling at him. And this was right in front of all of us. So if you've never been inside an MRI machine, let me explain it to you this way. You're lying on a bed, and it's dark inside, and you're in this narrow tube, and the scanner makes a really loud noise. To me, it sounds like the construction site is right next to your head. Um, and I want to show you a little video um, just to demonstrate what it's like. And imagine that you are this boy lying in that scanner. You have to 
have to do that for an hour <laughs> without moving your head. Uh, so you can see, I mean, I've been in this machine so many times that it doesn't bother me anymore. But you can see how people can be afraid, especially kids. They'll tell me that it sounds like a dentist or uh, like a bear trying to catch them. Um, it's, it's really scary for them. So this boy was in there and his mother was beating him and, and yelling at him. And I'm not blaming the mother here, that's not my intention. But I want to illustrate that this is what we're doing to our children. We're punishing them and we're incarcerating them and we're adjudicating them without really explaining why, without really providing them the context. So one of, um, you know, what this illustrates is that, yes, there are neurobiological um, correlates of aggressive behavior, but experience and, and, and environment matter as well. The most effective strategies for conduct disorder are actually parent management techniques. So studies from a number of labs have now shown that the most effective way to combat conduct disorder is through parent management training. And here again, we see very different kinds of responses. So in the, in the group of kids who are explosive and emotional and volatile, these kids really benefit from manage parenting that's warm and caring and sensitive while maintaining rules as well. So these are kids that benefit from time out, from very mild kinds of um, discipline. Not punishment, like not indiscriminate punishment, but, but, uh, but mild discipline. The first set of kids, however, the ones with callous and emotional traits, they don't really respond very well to that kind of, um, to that kind of parenting. In these kids, I showed you that they had an attenuated response to other people's pain. They also have an attenuated response to punishment. They're not really concerned with uh, time out or with the threat of punishment, so those techniques don't work for them. What works for them uh, more are reward-based um, parenting techniques. So they, they're more responsive to um, things like reward, things like encouragement, in general, these kids are more difficult to treat, and we have to use very systematic kinds of, of, of treatments that, that target both parenting and school and peers. But again, um, you know, both of, these, both of these approaches, they suggest that we need to be caring and supportive and not punitive, and not um, punitive without cause. Both of the examples that I gave you involved males, involved aggressive males. But it's a mistake to think that only males are aggressive, and it's a mistake to think that only males are um, in the juvenile justice system, and that we are not paying attention um, to, to, to males. Because actually, females are aggressive as well. And when we look at the numbers, we see that incidences of female violence and female crime has actually increased. So this is the most recent set of data. And here we see um, that females, female aggression is on the rise. And we see that um, in 1980, across multiple indices, so weapons, assault, vandalism, disorderly con conduct, women and females were about at 19%. But at, in 2010, that percentage was at 28%, so that's a 50% increase. So what's happening here? Part of what we look at, um, I'm, st I'm starting a new project together with Jyoti Nanda and Steve Lee, looking at females in the juvenile justice system. And my approach has been to look at the brain function and brain structure. And what we see in these females, when we look at the brain function and the brain structure of females with aggression, we see that the females are more vulnerable. So what we see is that the brain networks, the volume of the regions that are involved in perspective taking in empathic responding are actually smaller in females. And when we look at their brain function, we see similar vulnerabilities. So here's just one example. Here what you see is activation in two networks that are involved in perspective taking and mentalizing. And in one um, network, the, the females here are in orange. 
And what you see is that they're deactivated, they're lower in both of these kinds of networks. So what this suggests to us that, that it's the females that are driving this behavior. So there's something about these aggressive females that maybe they're at bigger risk, maybe they're more vulnerable. We have to test this idea further, of course, but it suggests that we shouldn't really um, just dismiss them. We shouldn't really um, just forget about these girls because actually, in the project that we now have, one of the things that we're finding out is actually girls are punished a lot more. Judges are giving them longer and harder sentences. Um, and why? <laughs> like, they expect them to be more empathic. They often expect them to be more pro-social. And so what, what it looks like it's happening is that judges are, because they expect them to, to, to do better, to know better, they're punishing them more harshly. And again, here, this is not helping them. Punishing girls is not a helpful response to violence. You know, where does this leave us? Where does um, all of this information leave us? What we see here is that violence is the result of a combination of biological, psychological, and social factors. Where does it leave us? We see from these data that violence is the result of a combination of biological, psychological, and social factors. And when you think back to my story, it should be evident that trying to continue to punish people like my attacker does not solve the problem of violence. As a society, we can do better when we are violent and abusive and dismissive towards our children, we lead by example. We teach them to be unsympathetic and uncaring. The problem of violence, I think, the solution to, prob to the problem of violence, I think, is not um, to turn our backs on these vulnerable kids, but instead to keep our minds and our hearts open. What we want to do is we want to make our kids feel understood and, val and valued. We want all of our children to feel understood and valued. And only by doing that can we teach them to also begin to care about others. We need more compassion and not cruelty in this world. Thank you.